I really like this lecture a lot. Okay, so we're gonna talk about effective record length, also known as ERL. Um, this is a really important input for RMC RFA, which we'll talk about later on today. We'll start talking about that software um, later on. Um, so let's dive in. So we're gonna talk about what is, what is ERL. Um, we're gonna talk about the definition of it. We're gonna discuss why we estimate the effective record length and how it can be used in a flood hazard analysis. And then we're gonna use, uh, excuse me, we're gonna demonstrate how to estimate um, the ERL. And then we're gonna show you um, how adding more data in a frequency analysis actually is able to reduce our uncertainty and increase the effective record length. And finally, we're gonna discuss how to calibrate your RMC best fit ERL to estimate the uncertainty compared to the RMC RFA method using something that we have coined called the pseudo ERL. So we'll talk more about what that is here at the end of the lecture. So, okay, before I give you a more technical definition of effective record length or ERL, I'm gonna show you the concept with an example. So on this slide, uh, there are two inflow records. On the left side, we have a typical data set that you might see in a study that includes systematic data, a flow interval, and, um, oh, and that flow interval, remember, is for a historic flood that we saw in the basin, and then a perception threshold that represents time periods where we don't have any observed floods, but we assume that there were floods that happened, and we think that they're probably in that range of, of magnitude. Um, on the right, we have a data set that only contains systematic data. So what might surprise you is that the two data sets in this example are equivalent, statistically speaking. They have the same distribution parameters, which means they have the same posterior mode frequency curve. They have the same credible intervals, which means they have the same uncertainty. And they have the same posterior predictive curve or mean frequency curve. Despite having different inflow records, these two data sets can be considered equivalent. How can that be, you might ask? We can estimate the equivalent amount of systematic data it would take to produce the same frequency curve and the same credible interval for our data set. And that's kind of what we're doing. Um, the effective record like concept allows us to model the uncertainty in our frequency curves by modeling the data as if it were an equivalent set of systematic data. This gives us um, a much simplified analysis and it gives us the same answer. This method of uncertainty modeling is called the parametric bootstrap. And this method is used in the RMC RFA software, which we'll learn about later in this course. Yeah, and there's the three equivalent lines. You might remember those from college, probably haven't used those since then, uh, but anyway, okay. Uh, so definitions, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, um, but I do wanna share with you some of the terminology so we're all speaking the same language. Um, NS represents the systematic record length, um, and T represents the total record length. As you can see, I've, I have an arrow that highlights that entire range of time. And the ERL will often fall somewhere between the number of years in the systematic record and the number of years in the total record. We can estimate the average value of the information provided by the historic flow intervals and perception threshold data by computing an average gain. So here's the equation for that. The average gain is the increase in effective record length divided by the increase in total record length. The average gain measures the amount of information provided by the censored data inputs. So in other words, just to kind of hit that really hard, when we have a, a one year of perception threshold that does not necessarily have the same weight as a systematic data. So it's gonna be one year or less worth in the, in the record length. That's the most it can have is one year. So it's probably gonna have less than that if it's not a systematic data point. Um, yeah, okay. So here's another quick example that's taken from example four in bulletin 17C appendix. In the chronology plot on the left, we start with the systematic record and collect a discharge, collected at a discharge gauge with a record length of 81 years. Because this record only contains systematic data, the effective record length is basically equal to the systematic data, so 81 years. In the middle chronology plot, we have some additional added data in the form of flow intervals and perception threshold. Sorry, lost my cursor here. 
uh, perception thresholds increasing our total record length to 146 years. However, this is not our effective record length because the additional data includes some uncertainty. The effective record length for this data set is about 110 years. In this example, we added 65 additional years of total record but the value of the information provided in the additional data was only worth 29 years because of the uncertainty in the data. The average gain of 0.45, there we go, there's the equation there, um, means that each additional year added to the total record provided about 0.45 equivalent years of information. In the third figure on the far right, we have added paleo non-exceedance bound data to the total record using a perception threshold, which increased the total record length to 840 years. The effective record length for this data set is about 130 years, resulting in an average gain of about 0.6. The average gain is relatively small in this example. Why do you think that is? Anybody have any questions or any, any suggestions? Yep. Okay, well, anyway, do you have any ideas about why the... Mm -hmm. Yes, there is high uncertainty. That's exactly right. So it turns out that the increase in the effective record length is relatively small compared to the total record length increase, and that is because... Um, there's high uncertainty. However, this does not negate the value of the paleo flood information. The effective record length is still increased by almost 20%, which is a significant increase. So that's something to keep in mind that in hydrology, we do wanna add all of the available information, the hydrologic information that we can. Now that we have a general understanding of what ERL is, let's discuss how we use ERL in a probabilistic flood hazard analysis. The effective record length is used in stochastic flood hazard analysis and risk analysis to model the uncertainty in the flow frequency curve. Effective record length is one of the key inputs for an RMC RFA model, which we'll talk about later on today. And the ERL directly affects the width of the uncertainty bounds. So if you walk away not understanding anything else from this lecture, please understand the ERL is directly impacting the width of the confidence interval. Um, the greater the ERL is, the less uncertainty we have in the flow frequency curve and the narrower our confidence interval will be. Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Little tiny words. Okay. Um, so let's look at how ERL impacts the frequency curve. First, an increase in the effective record length will reduce the width of the confidence or credible interval. Here we can see that the effect of doubling the effective record length from 50 to 100 years. So the, all I did was change the ERL just to see how it changes the, the credible intervals. And you can see that the 50 year record length, which are the orange curves are much wider. And then when we have a double of an ERL to 100 years, it makes our credible interval narrower. So that's the direct effect of having a larger ERL. Second, an increase in the effective record length will change the posterior predictive or mean hazard curve. This occurs because the uncertainty distribution is not symmetrical. Here you can see that doubling the effective record length shifts the mean hazard curve to the right, making it less frequent. The greater the effective record length, the closer to the posterior predictive curve, excuse me, the closer the posterior predictive curve will be to the posterior mode curve. So I don't have the mode curves plotted here, but you'll see as you add more data, and increase that ERL, that curve is gonna get closer, the mean curve is gonna get closer to the mode. Okay, when performing flow frequency analysis, it's important to make your best effort to locate records of historic floods, because just adding a few historic floods with perception thresholds can add a lot of value, making it worth the effort in most cases. Similarly, including quantile priors based on precipitation frequency analysis can add significant value as we discussed in the previous lecture. So now I'm gonna show you an example of how this works. In the next few slides, let's examine how additional data increases the effective record length. For this example, the systematic data includes 95 years of data. 
When we add historic data in the form of flow intervals, oh, okay. When we add historic data in the form of flow intervals and perception thresholds, we increase our ERL by 20 years, and now we have an ERL of 115. So, and you can see the in the plot, there's now a cyan dot with the flow interval on it. That's our historic point. Um, remember that the perception thresholds are not visually represented on the flow frequency curve. When we add paleo flood stage indicator data, so remember, we're going to represent that with a flow interval and a non-exceedance bound paleo information that we use as a perception threshold, which again, perception thresholds are not reflected in the plot of the curve. We increase our ERL by 160 years to an ERL of 275. Then we add um, regional skew data as a prior distribution on the skew parameter and we add 15 additional years to our ERL, giving us a total ERL of 290. And lastly, we go ahead and add precipitation frequency rainfall runoff data as quantile priors, and we gain an additional 60 years for a final ERL of 350 years. Clearly, there are significant benefits to be gained by including as much data as practical in any flood frequency analysis. So even if you're not gonna, if your basin um, doesn't have a precipitation frequency analysis, and even if your basin isn't, doesn't have a regional skew study that's appropriate for it, um, and maybe doesn't have paleo data, even if you don't have those pieces of information, adding additional historic floods really makes a big difference. So it's worthwhile to look for historic flood information um, because it, it can really add a lot of information to your analysis. So we're going to work on an exercise here shortly, but I'm going to introduce you to the toolbox that we're going to use in that exercise. Um, this is the RMC Effective Record Length Toolbox, and it was developed by the Risk Management Center as part of the Flood Hazard suite of Microsoft Excel spreadsheets to support flood hazard analysis. This toolbox can be used to estimate ERL for four analytical probability distributions. So we, we include the log Pearson type 3 distribution, the generalized extreme value or GEV distribution, the log normal distribution, and the normal distribution. So if you have data in any of those types, if you're interested in those four types of distributions, you can use this spreadsheet. Uh, for, just kind of to understand how the spreadsheet is set up, all of the yellow boxes are input cells. And at the top of each worksheet, there are cells to document information about the people and the project. And in step one, we can enter some basic information to document the variable and the units for our frequency curve. Um, and there, there's a couple of arrows pointing those out. Um, in step two, we select a distribution and we enter the distribution parameters for our frequency curve. These values are, um, sorry, the clicks are a little bit off. Alan, do you mind writing down that the animation on this one is messed up? Okay. Um, we select a distribution and enter the distribution parameters for our frequency curve, and these values are the posterior mode values. So we've already worked with VestFit a little bit, and those posterior mode parameters, the mean standard deviation and skew for the posterior mode, are what you're going to plug in here. Okay. In step three, we can enter the number of systematic record length. So in this example, there were 96 years of systematic data. And then we can enter the total record length. So remember, the total record length includes the whole record. So if you have um, perception thresholds or historic data, it includes the length of the whole window of time. Um, and these values are used to estimate the average gain or value from each of those individual years of additional data. In step four, we add the confidence interval that we want to use, and this is typically going to be the default, which is 90% confidence interval for our best fit analysis. Um, there are times when we might want to look at something other than that. I have used it for an 84% for FEMA for 84% um, confidence interval calculations, but um, generally in flood flow frequency analysis, we're using the 90% credible interval. Um, and the next selection is whether or not we want the software to estimate the quantile variance um, or whether we are going to enter it by the, as a user entered parameter. Since RMC Best Fit does not have an output quantile variance, then we're usually going to select the calculate option when you're using Best Fit. This toolbox is set up so you can easily copy and paste 
um, a set of AEP values along with the upper and lower credible limits from RMC best fit analysis. And it's important to always use the PACE special option when you're doing that because then you don't lose the formatting in the spreadsheet. Um, and then you can leave that variance column blank. And that's, that's what's gonna get populated when you have the calculate option selected. In step five, the user can control the number of decimal places for formatting the inputs and the precision of the outputs. I enter the num number of decimal places that I want. And the first value is used to format the upper and lower confidence limit steps in value four, or in step four, excuse me. Choosing a zero reformats the flow estimates to show as integer values, which makes sense. There's no decimal points. Um, and you can also select the number of significant figures for the result. That was that previous one. And then um, in most cases, two or three significant figures is plenty adequate. So don't go crazy. And step six uh, includes several default simulation parameters for the analysis. The default values shown here are probably adequate for most typical cases. Um, and you don't really need to change those values um, unless you wanna mess around and see you know, what the spreadsheet can do. Um, in step seven, that's, that's gonna be the button that you click to calculate the ERL estimate. And macros need to be enabled on your spreadsheet for that to actually work. Um, they can typically be enabled by pressing the enable content button that shows up in Excel. And then in step eight, we're gonna compare, um, sorry, in step eight, we're gonna compare the results um, and you'll be able to see the average effective record length calculated over all the AEPs, which I'll show you on the next slide. This is the value that should be typically used as the input to the RMC RFA um, analysis. The effective record length estimate will be different for each AEP value and I'll show you that here in a second. The coefficient of variation gives an indication of how much the effective record length varies over the AEPs. And the average gain gives an indication of the value of the information gained from including the flow intervals, perception thresholds, regional skew, and quantile prior information. Okay, so here's, here's what I was just talking about. So the main number that you're gonna be interested in is the effective record length that's estimated as an average over all the quantiles. That's the number that you wanna use most of the time. Um, and that's what you're gonna plug into the RMC RFA model. In this example, notice that the effective record length is different at each annual exceedance probability. So notice there, the, I think that's the 100 or 10,000, I can't tell how many zeros it is. I think it's 100,000. Um, there's uh, an ERL of 520, but the average is 420. So um, if we happen to be most interested in a particular failure mode, like overtopping, for instance, then we might wanna consider narrowing the range of our AEPs, because right now there's a pretty wide range, um, and we might um, narrow that, so we're more in the vicinity of dam overtopping AEP. Um, so that's some, some of the judgment that you can use when you're choosing what AEP to include in your analysis, or excuse me, what ERL to include. Okay, I'm gonna take a minute to identify some of the limitations of the toolbox. Um, it comes down to fundamental differences between the frequentist and Bayesian statistical paradigms. The ERL toolbox and the current version of RMC RFA are based on frequentist concepts. However, um, RMC best fit is using Bayesian statistical methods, and thus there are some limitations when estimating effective record length for an RMC best fit analysis. And I'm not gonna get into the theory in this lecture, I'm not gonna get real deep into it, um, but suffice it to say that effective record length is not a Bayesian concept, so it's kind of like fitting a round peg in a square hole. So why do we do it? Why do we compute the ERL for an RMC best fit analysis if there are some limitations? And the main reason is because the current version of RFA and many other stochastic flood hazard models require ERL as an input. So we've gotta, we've gotta have it so we can plug it in. Um, remember that the primary objective is for the uncertainty modeled in RFA to reasonably agree with the uncertainty computed in the best fit. So we're trying to get something similar between the two models, and that's why we're gonna do this next process. Um, if we're not satisfied, then we can manually adjust our ERL to get there. Okay. So in most cases, estimating ERL for an RMC best fit analysis with the toolbox will turn out just fine. However, there's one example showing limitations of the toolbox using example three from Bolton 17C. 
When we perform an RMC best fit analysis on this data set and plug in the results from the toolbox, we get an estimated ERL of about 70 years. Now let's compare what RMC RFA would do um, given the effective record length and compare to our, our best fit results. In this figure, we can see that the green solid line is the expected frequency curve and the dashed green lines represent the 90% confidence interval that will be obtained in RFA if we use that ERL of 70. The open squares, diamonds, triangles, and circles represent the posterior predictive posterior mode and the 90% credible interval that was calculated in our RMC best fit analysis. And we can see that the best fit and RFA results are similar, but they don't match exactly. And that's to be expected um, because they are using different paradigms, statistical paradigms. We could try to achieve better agreement by manually adjusting the ERL estimate. So what value of effective record length might be a better match? Should we increase or decrease our original estimate of 70 years? We don't need to be overly precise with our adjustment, just a simple visual check is usually sufficient. After several trials, we can see that an ERL of about 50 years provides a much better match to the best fit posterior predictive frequency curve compared to our original estimate of 70 years. Also notice that the match improved at the upper credible limit However, the match got worse for our lower credible limit. So I'm gonna say that again. So check the top, the upper limit. The match is a lot better and check our posterior predictive curve, which is our mean curve that matches a lot better, but the lower credi the credible interval or credible limit, excuse me, uh, it's got a pretty poor match right now. And that is just because they are using different methods of estimation. But, um, Strictly speaking, the new estimate of 50 years is not really the effective record length of our data. Um, and so we're gonna call this our pseudo ERL, just so that we identify this is not an actual ERL. Future versions of RFA will eliminate this limitation because they will import the data directly from best fit. And so we won't have to input an ERL anymore. During this presentation, we learned that ERL is used as an input parameter in the stochastic flood hazard analysis and risk analysis to model the uncertainty in a frequency curve. We also learned that the greater the ERL is, the less uncertainty we have in the frequency curve. We learned that there is a lot of added value when we add as much data as we can into our best fit analysis to increase our effective record length. And we also learned about the RMC ERL toolbox that can be used to estimate effective record length along with some of the limitations. To cap it off, we learned that when it makes sense to manually adjust an ERL estimate, we should typically try to match the ERL posterior predictive curve. And if the ERL does need manual adjustment, feel free to call the RMC for guidance.